Thank you so much. Um, I'm Jenny Choi. I'm the director of bariatrics at Montefiore Medical Center in Bronx, New York. Uh, I want to thank the moderators for inviting me to give a talk on leak after gastric bypass. What I'm going to be talking about is probably not quite as sexy as Dr. Nguyen's talk, but I'm going to talk about early detection and management. I have no disclosures. So the incidence of gastric bypass leaks have gone way down. It used to be as high as 8% or so, but in the recent years, as we've gained more experience, better technique, it's gone down probably to less than 1%. And these leaks can happen anywhere along where the staple lines are or where the anastomoses are. And this typically happens most commonly at the gastrojejunostomy. And with this experience, we've learned that the factors that are associated with higher risk of leak are the super obese patients, BMI 50 and above, male, because they carry a lot of visceral fat, and patients with multiple comorbidities. And as you know, the patients are getting sicker and heavier. And obviously, the revisional bariatric surgery has the highest risk of leak. So what's really the big deal about gastric bypass leak? Dr. Wynn just told you with sleeves gain, gaining more popularity, so why do we care about gastric bypass leaks? Um, it's still one of the leading causes of mortality along with a PE, and it's a major cause of litigation. And typically it's because of delay in diagnosis and treatment. And if you've had any of these leaks, it can be devastating. The patient's in the hospital forever, ICU, and some family member will have your cell phone number. Right. And what you notice now is that these obese patients, they're not like other patients. They don't have the same clinical signs and symptoms, and it's sometimes more difficult to pick these signs up. And unfortunately, it's not like other leaks that we see in colorectal cases, biliary cases. We can't just sit and wait uh, and treat them with conservative management. And there's un unfortunately no one good sign or study to make this diagnosis. So these are the pictures you definitely don't want to see when you walk in to your office on Monday, a terrible leak on an upper GI or an old abscess cavity on a CAT scan seven days after surgery. And when you finally take these patients back to the operating room, they have uh, pus and uh, bile stain, fibrinous exudate everywhere. So how do we prevent these leaks from happening? So some of it's sort of a surgical mantra, right? You want to make sure you, you pick the correct staples, right? You want to make sure because it, uh, stomach has different thickness, you want to make the right choices. And some of it's sort of what's been taught all along residency and training. You got to have no tension, no ischemia, and you want to make sure there's no distal obstruction. So some of the other techniques that's come around, we have now more options. Um, we sometimes over sew the staple line, sometimes there's all kinds of different reinforcements, fiber and glue. Uh, leaving uh, routine drains, but unfortunately the data hasn't been great over the years. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, the current literature out there about the different techniques. The one thing that the data does show is that there's no difference between different types of uh, technique, anticholic, retrocholic, or the different types of EEA, linear, or Hanson anastomosis. So let's talk about staple line reinforcement because we've been talking about this for years. Uh, so this is a recent paper that came out. Um, screened almost 17,000 articles and looked at, after screening, looked at 295 studies and looked at over 56,000 patients and looking for leaks and obviously the rates are low. And take into account that this is a meta-analysis and it has the usual pitfalls of meta-analysis, un being unable to control for the different factors. But given that this is such a large study, I think it has some merit. And if you see, the, if you do nothing, no over sewing, no reinforcement, the leak is as high as 2.6%. But it goes down with over sewing, um, with uh, other reinforcement being the lowest with the pericardium, uh, to down to about 1%. The one caveat to this study was that it was an industry sponsored uh, study. Um, and, and you don't have to guess to know who benefited uh, from this study. But this is one study, but it's got a large uh, number of patients, so I think it deserves some merit. But if you look at a different study, it says completely something different. This is a Michigan um, bariatric, bariatric database that looked at over 16,000 patients with 71 leaks. They had a, it's a case control, and they matched it uh, to one to two ratio with the normal controls uh, based on body mass index, sex, and the year of procedure. 
So this study showed that the buttressing material had a higher rate of reek, leak, um, odds ratio of greater than eight. And the other thing that looked at was that fiber and sealants were associated with lower um, rate of leaks. So what this tells you is that the data is sort of all over the place. It's not clear that there is one best technique. So if there's no way to minimize or there's no best practices of surgery, how can we detect these leaks early and treat them? So people started leaving routine drains. And so what was the rationale? Why? Because you want to detect this fast as you can, and if there is a leak, you can control for it. So you don't have to take these patients back to the operating room. And so I just highlight one, one of many studies that, that are out there. Uh, routine versus uh, no drains. And it basically shows that there's a higher rate of a leak with a routine drain. And it didn't change the number of patients who needed to go back to the operating room. And if you look at any other literature, looking at colorectal data, um, Whipple data, the leaving routine drains longer than three days post-op actually increases the, uh, the le leak rate. So routine drains are no good. So what do you have to actually do? You've got to rely, rely on what the patient looks like, right? The clinical signs and symptoms. And there's a myriad of, of signs that we look for. But don't forget, these patients don't have the same signs that we see for normal physiologic patients. And the one factor that's been shown to be sensitive for a leak uh, or other complication is a tachycardia greater than 120 uh, per minute. Um, can you fast forward to the next slide? Oh, thank you. So this study just highlights that. Uh, the associated factors seen in this study uh, with gastric bypass leak are tachycardia, respiratory distress, and low urine output. And these patients who have these heart signs likely need to go to the operating room. But let's say you have patients that don't have, they sort of linger, they don't quite have these signs, what do you do with them? So people decided maybe a routine upper GI is the right answer. Um, let's, if there is a leak, let's find them. And typically these were done post-op day one or two. And this is a large meta-analysis that looked at routine versus selective upper GIs. And what you see is that when you do a routine upper GI, there's a huge number of false negatives and false positives. The sensitivity is less than 70%. And when you do selective upper GIs, even with clinical symptoms, this uh, sensitivity is still low. What that really tells you is that a negative upper GI doesn't really rule out a leak. Surgery is probably the only definitive test. So what tests are you left with? So we talked a little bit at the upper GI. CAT scan, blue dye test, amylase, amylase that you can test through the drain, and a CRP. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about each one of these. So this study actually looked at some of the th things that we've uh, discussed. The risk factors sort of confirm what we already know. BMI greater than 48, tachycardia, hypotension, white blood cell count above 15. Those are risk factors uh, that are associated with a higher rate of leak. And if you look at the diagnostic tests here, CAT scan is actually the most sensitive in this study. But the false negative rate was still 15%. But keep in mind, CAT scans are actually a very good test to look for other things, right? The patients who have tachycardia hypotension, the other killer, other mortality risk is a PE. And obviously, that will help you rule that out. And the PE is the one thing that will keep you out of the operating room. And if you look at the methylene blue test and upper GI, false negative uh, rates were almost 30%. So C, CRP has been a marker that's been used in other areas. Um, and this is not something that we've used routinely in our institution. Uh, and this is a very small study, so keep that in mind. Um, in other uh, areas, such as colorectal, pancreas surgeries, uh, they look at CRP. And this has been associated with um, looking, finding uh, leaks or complications, typically on post-op day four with a cutoff level, level of 140. In this study, they only had 17 leaks, and the CRP was checked, and they looked at sort of different series from post-op day two to seven, and sensitivity was 100%, and the specificity of 80%, 84% on post-op day two. And typically, these leaks happen on post-op post day five, so this was actually a very uh, sensitive screening tool to catch those leaks early. So now you have that. So what are your choices? Now what do you do? Now you, you have a high index of sus suspicion that these patients have a leak. So what are we going to do? Um, 
historically, uh, we used to have to prove to ourselves that the patients had a leak, right? Typically, if you're not positive that the patient has a leak, they didn't go to the operating room. So if you look at the earlier data, when they looked at 5% leak rate, their conservative management was almost 65, 70%. But what we're finding out now is that early intervention is what's really needed to decrease the morbidity of these patients. And if you look at this study, um, there was uh, 64 patients uh, at the rate of one, a little over 1% that had a leak, and these were divided into early and late leaks. Uh, about a third of these patients were treated conservatively, and this is the algorithm that they use. So patients, if they had mild symptoms or very little, just sort of that vague discomfort with minimal white count, no tachycardia, these patients were treated conservatively. And over time, part of the workup was getting a CAT scan and doing a, a percutaneous drainage as needed. For the patients who had severe symptoms, some of the, like the ones that we just talked about earlier, these patients went to the operating room. And I think this is actually a very uh, good point about this paper, is that they looked at early versus late outcomes. So if this is not from the diagnosis, but this is from when the patients first started having symptoms. If the patients were treated less, less than 24 hours after the initial advent of the symptoms, patients did a lot better. Um, and if you look at the two studies, uh, less than 24 hours, average of 14 hours versus 43 hours for the delayed group, the ICU treat patients requiring ICU treatment, length of stay, are almost double, uh, triple the, the, uh, to that of the early group. And the two mortalities that happened in this study, they were both in the late group. So in conclusion, what does this say? Uh, incidents of leak after gastric bypass are low and it's getting lower, but they can still be devastating. Um, I didn't talk about the jejunal jejunostomy leaks, but the mortality of jejunal jejunostomy leaks, 40 to 50%. And they, they typically, however, happen still around the gastro jejunostomy around post-op day five to eight. But if you know the way we're going, the patients are leaving by post-op day one or two. So what the, we're probably not gonna see these patients when they start to have these symptoms of a leak. And there's no clear surgical technique that says one is better than the other. Reinforcements, um, overstitching, it's not clear. There, the data is very mixed on, it, on whether one option is better than the other. And the drains and routine studies, they have no clear benefit, and it has increased cost and patient discomfort. And I didn't mention this earlier, but getting an upper GI the next day increases your length of stay probably by another day or two, and the patients really hate having drains. Oh. And the reality is there's no one modality that can make the diagnosis. And I think CRP is kind of an interesting thing I haven't used before, but I think that it could be a valuable adjunct tool to helping that early diagnosis. But the early intervention is actually the key, uh, whether it's the conserv aggressive conservative management or going back to the operating room, this is what's gonna decrease morbidity after gastric bypass. Thank you so much.